Welcome back to New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. This just in, World War III will be lethal and fast. We've got that story, plus anonymous internet vigilantes. But first, the story that's still kind of developing as I'm taping this on my end. It's still Wednesday, October 5th, and the story is developing. James, I believe you kind of woke up to this, and you're already October 6th. NSA contractor arrested for stealing secrets, already being called a Snowden 2.0, and the biggest hack of the NSA since Snowden in 2013 in mid-August. We reported even right here on New World Next Week that a mysterious group calling itself the Shadow Brokers had managed to hack the NSA's Equation Group a government cyber attack hacking group associated with the NSA and released a bunch of the organization's hack tools. However, as the New York Times reported October 5th, an NSA contractor, Harold Thomas Martin III, age 51, from Glen Burnie, Maryland, was arrested back on August 29th, with the FBI investigating whether he is the party responsible for stealing and disclosing highly classified computer codes developed to hack into the networks of foreign governments. Again, right there, of course, noting we hack governments all around the world, we being the state of the West. The information believed stolen by this contractor, who, like Snowden, worked for the deep state consulting firm Booz Allen Hamilton, which is responsible for building and operating many of the agency's most sensitive cyber ops. Predictably, Edward at Snowden chimed in with a tweet stating, This is huge. Did the FBI secretly arrest the person behind the reports NSA sat on huge flaws in U.S. products? So, in other words, we now at least seem to be being told the entity behind the shadow brokers appears to have been found. And as speculated, it's a rogue insider and not Russia. James. Now, uh, for people who don't remember the shadow brokers story, we did cover it in our episode on Soros getting hacked. So we'll Mm -hmm. put that in the show notes in case you need a refresher on that. But. I haven't seen a follow-up to that original Shadow Brokers story. I know they were asking for one million Bitcoin, and if they got it, they were going to release all of these tools. I'm pretty sure that didn't happen, but perhaps you can confirm that? I think further in this story, which the link I have is from Blacklisted News, I think it clicks over to Zero Hedge. They do report on the million dollar in Bitcoins that seem to say that they had it. No, no, I don't. not a million, $500 million, <laughs> 1 million bitcoins. Uh, anyway, well, actually 600 million in today's dollars. Uh, all right, so this, let's use this as an object lesson. Let's just, uh, I mean, disregarding all of the potential shenanigans going on here and misdirects and whatever else is going on underneath the surface of this story, let's just use this as an object lesson for anyone who does have actual information the, the valuable information on anything to do with the deep state or any of these, you know, bad actors in, in government. Do not say, hey, look, we have all this information and maybe we'll release it later if you're kind to us, if you give us a million Bitcoin, blah, 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 whatever it is. Uh, because that will guarantee putting a big crosshairs over you and you will get taken in and, and dealt with. Now, if you come out immediately with whatever information you have and put it out there as in the most public way you can in, in, all at once, that is the best way to ensure that you probably won't get killed anyway. Um, you might get smeared and whatever else will happen. But still, anyway, I have no idea what the actual story of the Shadow Brokers are and what their motives really were. But I think that's important to keep in mind so that people don't end up becoming the next Danny Casalero or DC Madam or any of the other people who end up getting suicided when they come out and say, hey, I have this really big story I'm working on. I have this really important information, but I'm not going to release it yet. You know, just just wait. Well, and whether you mean to or not, you're kind of referencing what just happened just a day or so ago as well, where WikiLeaks had this big anticipated thing that ended up just kind of being a 10th anniversary celebration. So we will include the flashback. Actually, yeah, James, that that Soros episode is actually a wildly popular episode of New World Next Week. We'll include links to that, just like we include links to everything else that we mentioned down in the show notes. Because it's worth noting, Booz Allen Hamilton is owned by the Carlyle Group, which is headed up by the CIA, who again are leaking from the NSA. This is essentially this convoluted thing happening. I'll include a semi-related story that's also developing in the sort of virtual flag terror world that's now completely unveiled again. Huh, not Russia? 
Yahoo gave U.S. spy agencies access to hundreds of millions of users' emails. That story spilling out as well. However, we move to our second story on this 286th episode of New World Next Week for October 6th, 2016, where it has been reported World War III will be extremely lethal and fast. U.S. military bosses have revealed their predictions for a major conflict and say war between nation states at some point in the future is almost guaranteed. Artificial intelligence and smart weapons would be at the fore with a modern nation states acting aggressively the likely enemy. A conventional conflict in the near future will be extremely lethal and fast and we will not own the stopwatch, said Major General William Hicks on a Future of the Army panel at the annual meeting of the Association of the U.S. Army in Washington, this according to Defense One. The speed of events are likely to strain our human abilities. The speed at which machines can make decisions in the far future is likely to challenge our ability to cope, demanding a new relationship between man and machine. China and Russia are both mustering conventionally massive militaries that are increasingly technological and forcing the Pentagon to contemplate and prepare for, quote, violence on the scale that the U.S. Army has not seen since Korea, end quote. So we will include the link to that original Defense One report as well. So, James, on one level, it seems they're rattling the saber for World War Three pretty quickly. And the situation in Syria, which we haven't actually discussed in any great detail in the last several weeks, of course, is still popping off severely. It certainly is. And uh, obviously, there's a lot of this chatter going around, not just here, but this story sounds like an advertisement for World War III in some sense. And I think it is, because if you look at the Association for the U.S. Army, it is an advocacy group, uh, you know, for the U.S. Army. And one of their central missions is fostering public support of the Army's role in national security. So, yay, yay, U.S. Army, protect us from this horrible, evil threat that's coming around the corner. We need World War III, and it'll be fast and lethal, and a lot of people are going to die, but hey, we'll be, uh, we'll be on top of the scrap heap when it's all over. Um, and it, that really does seem to be uh, one of the vectors that this is being brought to us. And then, of course, there's all the other stories about, oh, look, you know, the uh, Russia's doing this big evacuation drill, 40 million people, nuclear bunkers and all of this. I mean, all of this Cold War stuff is being dredged up again in a very concerted way um, recently. And now we have people outright advocating for, hey, we need a no-fly zone over Syria. And that, yeah, that's going to put us in direct conflict with Russia. You know, better suit up, boys. Um, It's getting really, really crazy. And let's just hope that all this is is scaremongering in order to drum up business for the military-industrial complex. That would be the, I guess, the best best thing we could hope for in a situation like this, rather than the crazy psychopaths who really have desired World War III for a very long time actually bringing something like that about. But there's definitely a propaganda campaign surrounding it right now and trying to drill it into the public consciousness. Well, and I, I wouldn't have realized it in prepping the show, but as you talked about it, in a way, it's kind of like our previous week's story about the sort of rich panic buying, you know, underground bunkers. It is like an advertisement. So it's sort of, again, no matter what you know, sort of multinational business you're in, World War Three is great for business as whatever the heavy metal album cover war is business and business is good i'm mangling it but i'll move on to our third and final story this week james which is a bit of a good news story since 2012 the message board pub peer has served as a sort of 4chan for science allowing anyone to post anonymous comments on scientific studies originally intended as a forum for the discussion of methods and results Pub Peer has perhaps become best known as a clearinghouse for accusations of scientific error, fraud, and misconduct, forcing journals to issue corrections and retractions, damaging careers, and eventually embroiling the site in a court case in which it's being advised by Edward Snowden's legal team at the American Civil Liberties Union. In the view of its critics, Pub Peer enables an unchecked stream of accusations with no accountability. But to its supporters, Pub Peer is maybe the only consistently effective way to expose fraud and error in the current scientific system. It exists at a time of quiet crisis for science and science journals when the community is concerned about an inability to replicate past results, the so-called reproducibility crisis, and the number of papers retracted is on the rise. 
The traditional peer system review seems unable to address these problems. According to Retraction Watch, a blog that monitors scientific corrections, errors, and fraud, said at least three high-profile scientists in the past few months have had their studies retracted by journals after their data was questioned by anonymous commenters on PubPeer. So they can wag their fingers and shake their head as much as they want, but proof's in the pudding, so to speak. That's exactly the point of this story. The proof's in the pudding. I can't can't imagine how anyone in good faith can argue that this is somehow in and of itself a... a dangerous phenomenon that must be stopped. Oh, we must stop people from being able to comment on scientific journals without, you know, going through the approved channels and putting their name to it so that they can get tarred and feathered. The point here is, yes, in any anonymous kind of platform like this, of course, there's going to be accusations and mudslinging and backstabbing and people with personal axes to grind. But the point is what actually emerges from the the threads, the investigations of these different papers. If you find actual, real mistakes at best or outright fraud at worst, and then it is retracted because it is fraudulent or it is wrong, that's a good thing. And science should be celebrating that because we do not want fraudulent material or incorrect things in the scientific record. That's what science is about, right, guys? Scientists are these angels floating on clouds that are only interested in the truth and nothing but the truth. And that's all they care about. Not not career, not reputation, not about, oh, please don't expect expose my frauds. It's all fraud should be exposed so that we can come to the truth, right? Who could possibly be against that? People with careers and dollar signs in their eyes, of course, um, and people who are embarrassed about being exposed for committing fraud or being involved in uh, faulty and shoddy research. So I suggest people look at that full motherboard um, article and it goes into a lot more detail about the whole phenomenon, including this Sarkar guy who's attempting to sue uh, PubPeer right now. Uh, he also attempted to sue the university that retracted their offer, their, their job offer to him once his work got uh, denigrated by the site. Um, but the they threw that out. The, you know, you can't sue the university, but... They're still going ahead with the, the, the lawsuit against the website. So because a website brings accusations that must have some substance to them, there must be something there, because obviously a lot of people are, are very concerned about it. But nope, um, he's still trying to sue them to try to get this these people's information. It's ridiculous. And I think ultimately this will... This is the kind of thing I don't think you can put the toothpaste back in the tube. This is the future of uh, of internet based open source research and into and, and keeping an eye on the scientific uh, community which desperately needs an eye keeping on <laughs> at the moment and I'll throw in a link to a, a recent uh, editorial I wrote about the crisis of science precisely about the problems of how money comes in and skews research and uh, and and priorities and ends up with a lot of shoddy research being published so this is a good thing overall well and that really that gets to the heart of all of it. You're almost describing it as something that we used to call the fourth estate or something that we used to call investigative journalism in that media. And again, those all things tie in. And I think we are winning in a lot of ways that the tide has turned and you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube because we are winning. Now I have a, we are winning focused show called good news next week. And the latest episode gets into some more athletes exercising their anti-war views and refusing to hang out with the military. So we'll include links to that in the show notes as well. If you've got good news stories or New World Next Week stories, hit us up using hashtag New World Next Week on the tweets. And again, James, I appreciate it. I appreciate all the research you do. And again, I hope people will listen to Morning Monarchy to keep up with all the latest news as it's happening. Until next week, talk to you later. Thanks, man.